It's been vacant for 10 years, but a silent killer lurks inside. Tom Champagne, a volunteer with the Cranesville Fire Department in the town of Amsterdam, New York, leads a training exercise. Here we go. The 32-year-old father of two had no idea what was waiting for him when he kissed his wife goodbye on this morning. She said, Ginger, are you sitting down? It's bad. It's your husband. Tom disappears in the blast. The explosion is comparable to four sticks of dynamite. It's like Tom was standing directly behind three jet engines at full power. It was just complete devastation down there. Tommy wasn't where he was standing. Mike Bellamy, the assistant fire chief, was standing right next to Tom. I looked to my left, and I, I could see him under a bunch of rubble. And all I could see was the top of his coat, you know, and his head sticking up. I ran through that crowd, and there was a state trooper that came up to me and said, ma'am, you can't come any further. I said, the hell I'm not. I know those feet. He said, excuse me? I said, that's my husband. I mean, it had blown his helmet right off his head. I held his hand, and I basically told him, um, I said, you got two boys. I said, you got to stay alive for these boys. Probably, you know, one of the worst days of my life. If there's ever a time in my life where I need to pray, it is at that moment in time. And I did. Four firefighters were buried in the blast in the 2,700 square foot house. Gone. The explosion shakes neighbors 10 miles away. I was standing here, knocked back to the road. Jim Romaine was literally knocked off his feet still jittery from an earthquake that rocked Amsterdam just one week earlier. That one measured 5.1 on the Richter scale, but this felt bigger, much bigger. I think the best way to describe it is like being next to a thunderclap. And it was gone before you could blink, but it was... Jim owned the house and was behind the lens of the camera. And this is what I see when I get up. Oh my God. I said, someone must be killed here. Here, uh, you kids want to kick that wood off the road, make sure there's nothing with nails sticking out of it. And my first thought was that they're going to be ambulances coming up and down the road. Slowing down the explosion, you can clearly see the frightening force. Those are heavy six-by-six six beams, splintered by the blast, sent flying like toothpicks at 70 miles an hour. And that massive chunk, that's the entire dining room floor. Big, huge pieces of the house, and I, you know, I mean, if you're talking pieces that weigh a thousand pounds, must be laying on somebody, or where, where are they? I just remember my body crushing and flying through the air. Jared Gilston was one of the four firefighters blown back by the blast and hit by flying debris. Mike Byer actually stuffed, took off his hood and stuffed it in. The, I had a hole right here in my face. He stuffed it to try to stop the bleeding. He was shook up pretty bad, and... Uh... Understandably so, he just took a house to the face. The Cranesville Volunteer Fire Department was going to torch the abandoned house to get some practice putting out a structure fire. Now, for the first time, what went wrong? The cause of the explosion was a, uh, a buildup of vapors. Accelerants that were used in the training exercise were at the epicenter of the blast. They were supposed to help control how quickly the house burned. Our special look inside shows the accelerant, a petroleum product, was placed in the basement. Firefighters didn't know it, but it also had gasoline mixed in. Fumes started building immediately. There were no windows in the basement for the vapors to escape. To make things worse, the house sat down in a small valley. The vapors formed a lethal but odorless gas, turning the house into a powder keg. I saw, like, the shock wave coming at me. Believe it or not, that's the man at the flashpoint, Tom Champagne. Whether it was a miracle or simply the grace of God, Tom survived. A split-second decision just before he threw the flare may have been the difference between life and death. And I remember reaching and pulling down my, my shield on my helmet, Everything by the book, where it's supposed to go, you know, full, full protective envelope. 
Tom's polyaerolite face shield wasn't used by firefighters until 1983. An unbreakable plastic that reflects heat. Without that and his Kevlar suit, he almost certainly would have been killed. Once I got over to Tommy, you know, he was... I saw that he was breathing, he was alive, and I'm like, thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God. It was still shocking to see a, a two-story house within one click of a VCR frame to being leveled. That's, yeah, that's, that's shocking even for me. Tom's leg was badly broken, but not his spirit. This tattoo, I got that because it is part of the history, and the friends that came out of it, they're never going to leave me, so it's just a little, it's a reminder. I'm very lucky that he can walk. He was in a wheelchair for seven and a half months. We got through it with, with each other, and we're here for the department because the department was there for us. And out of this gray cloud of smoke on this terrible day comes a silver lining. This tape is now being used in fire training to protect the brave men and women with their lives on the line to protect us. There's a bond even before the incident happened. It's, it's a brotherhood. It truly is. And like they say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger.